welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I believe there's those of you that are right now in this place ready to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. We don't have to wait until the end of the service, but right now God's spoken to you. You were just listening a few moments ago and you said, you know, Here's what you said to yourself in one way or another. You said it like this to yourself. Tell me if this is not true. You said, I need to get my act together with God. I could feel, you could feel there was something you're missing. And the very thing that you're missing is you haven't yet really let go. Oh, you haven't let go of yourself. And you haven't given God all of your heart and all of your life. Here we are in this safe and friendly place. God just spoke to you through this dumb man that's standing in front of you. And you know that he just read your mail. And now it's time for you to make the change. It's time for you right now to get out of your seat, whoever you are, and there's a bunch of you in here, Get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. We're going to pray together, invite Jesus into our hearts. And this is your way of saying, God, I need to get right with you, and I'm going to do that tonight. I'm going to do it right now. I'm not going any further. I'm not going any longer. I'm going to do it tonight, right now. And you need to right now, I'm talking to you. You know I'm talking to you. You need to right now get out of your seat, right now, and just get down the aisle and meet me right here in front. And you know it. And you know it. Whoever you are, just come on. There's one. There's a bunch more. No clapping. There's two. There's three. There's four. In fact, to tell you the truth, God spoke to me. There's 25 of you that need to come right now. You just need to come. There's six, there's seven, there's eight, there's nine, there's 10, there's 11. Just need to come. You know it as well as I do. Tonight is your night of salvation. You have a divine appointment with God. There's no reason going any further. I don't need to speak to you anymore. God has already spoken to you. And you know that during worship tonight, you said to yourself, wow. In fact, you came here tonight because you knew you could get right with God. There's a ton of you coming. You just come. Just come and stand here. Just come and stand. Just get out of your seat. If you're in the family rooms, you have children, ushers, help them out of the family room. Just tell them to come, bring their children. Wherever you're at, if you're in the foyer, just tell an usher, they'll let you in. But you get out of your seat and you come. Tonight, now, is your night. In fact, we're, we're sharing a little message from the Word of God tonight on why people miss opportunities. And you do not want to miss this opportunity that you have. going to give you a moment more because I know there's more of you that need to come. Can I just share this with you? This is like crazy. In this section right here, there's five of you that need to come. You say, well, how do you know that? Because God is impressing that in my heart. Whether you come or don't come, I'm not talking about that section. I'm not talking about this section. I'm talking about this section right here. There's three of you in this section that need to come. Whether you come or don't come, I'm not going to put pressure on you. But God told on you. He knows who you are. You need to get out of your seat. You need to come. You need to come. There's a bunch of you in this section. A bunch of you in this section. A bunch of you in this section. You need to come. This is a move of God, my friends. Right before your eyes, the Bible says no one comes to the Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not a man. 
making this happen, talking someone into it. It's just the Holy Spirit moving on the hearts of people before your very eyes. You're seeing a miracle take place, a move of God, a move of God. Not a move of man, but a move of God drawing his people home, drawing his people home. Wow. Is that cool? All of you, Dave, come up here. I want you all to look to your left. This is Pastor Dave right here, really a good guy. No weird, strange stuff goes on, I promise you. I need SPTs up here. No weird or strange stuff uh, at all goes on. He's going to do three things, and then he'll let you come right back in the sanctuary. Number one, he's going to pray with you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. You need to invite him into your heart. He's a gentleman. He doesn't come in because you need him. Listen to me. He doesn't come in because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. And he comes in because you invite him. He's a gentleman. He'll lead you in a prayer to do that. Number two, he'll give you some free information about what to do next. Now that you're a Christian, what does God expect from you? Hey, let's find out. I'll give you some free information. Take home, read about it. Simple as that. Thirdly, he'll, he'll explain to you what a spiritual personal trainer is, someone to help you get strong in Jesus. You need somebody to love you enough to pray for you, to care for you, to meet you before church service. In other words, you know what happens? You come forward, then you go back and fall through the cracks. You go back doing the same old stuff, and you wonder, here's what you'll do. Six months or eight months from now, you'll say, where's God? Well, God is here, and you've got to come after him. He says, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. First call is you draw near to him. We'll help you to do that so that he'll draw near to you. Only takes a few minutes. The people you came with, they'll wait for you. So listen, we're going to let you go. Go with him, Pastor Dave. Pray with him. Come right back in the church service. He'll let you come right back in. Is that okay? Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Wow. Come on, somebody. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I hate to ask you to stand again. Are you okay with standing again? Feels like, you know, feels like we came out of the Catholic Church again. We haven't been there in a long time. Remember how when we were kids, we got up and down, up and down, up and down? Well, bless their hearts, man. They got us conditioned for doing that just now. We're not against that. Great people, and we're not belittling anybody, so don't take it wrong. Uh, we love them. In fact, we're going to pray for them as well as ourselves right now. I'm going to get down on my knees. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. And we thank you, Father, that we haven't come into the house of God to hear from a man or hear from a woman. We hear from a young man, old man, white man, black man, brown man. We're not, we're not here to do that, God. We're here to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for blessing all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as us, blessing us. We appreciate that. But bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvesters Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. We thank you for the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you for Trinity Emmanuel Baptist Ecclesia Church. We thank you, God, for the way. We thank you for San Bernardino Temple. Our Catholic brothers and Adventist brothers and sisters, bless them, Lord, as you would bless us. And we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Because, Lord, it's about your kingdom being built, not a man's. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. <laughs> well, go ahead and take your seat. I want to share with you what the Lord put on my heart. I was just thinking about how many people miss opportunities. We're all people of opportunities that we've missed. We've all belonged to that could have and should have club. You know, we knew of a time when we could have done something, but we didn't do it, we should have done it. And I think before we get into the word of the Lord tonight, I want you to know that for those of you that are here, to understand that this is the manual on how to do life. When we come into the house of God, it should not be someone just telling us what to do and 
not telling us how to do it. It shouldn't be coming along and someone saying you ought to be this and do that and do this and do that and not sharing the word of God with us. It so explicitly explains how life ought to be. When you do life this way, the word of God's way, you truly get blessed in every area of your life. There's not a person in here that doesn't want to be blessed. So teaching you the word of God is one thing, but teaching you the nature and the attributes and the characteristics of God that goes together with the understanding of the word of God really takes the word of God and explodes with great wisdom in your heart and life. All of a sudden you start applying the word of God to your marriage and your marriage is different than it's ever been before. Actually, you fall deeper in love as you get older instead of further apart as you get older. In the world, they fall further apart all the time. They start off in love and then they get, if they even stay together, it's a habit. You know, it's just the only reason they're together because they've got a habit. That's sad. But with the kingdom of God, you start off in love and you get and you fall more in love as the years go on to the place where you're just inseparable with each other. Marriages work and children grow in the ways of the Lord. And Deborah's tonight babysitting three grandchildren, has for four days. She's quite a trooper. And then she's coming tomorrow morning to preach the gospel to that girlfriend. And um, then Bible college tomorrow night. And uh, I thought it was difficult taking care of me until we had the three kids spend four nights with us. Tomorrow, Frida. <laughs> so, but they're great, and but she's a real, she's a great nana. And you just fall greater in love all the time. It's the way it ought to be. Things start to work better. Life starts to work better. Marriages work good, but business works well. Economics start to fall in place. You know, the real bottom line, you care about who's in politics and who's in the White House and who isn't, but the bottom line is who gives a flip as long as Jesus is on the throne. You know, and so it all works out because you're now every day applying what you know in the word of the Lord. If you don't apply it, you'll forget it. If you forget it, then what happens is you don't ever get to use it. And I think that's one of the most important things is to allow the Spirit of the Lord to be your teacher tonight. In fact, this is part number one of why people miss opportunities. We miss opportunities all the time, and we stop thinking about opportunities. We say, wow, you know, that business opportunity. When I think of missing opportunities, I think about business opportunities. You know, some people might think it's, you know, it's a real estate investment or it's a stock market investment. I had that opportunity to invest in Home Depot or, you know, uh, uh, Apple. I mean, who would ever want to buy a little uh, a trademark who has an apple with a bite taken out of it? That's kind of weird. You remember those days? And many of us never invested in that company. Missing opportunities, that's kind of I think about. But have you ever thought about opportunities that are small? That if you do the word of God, God will bless you. The Bible says in Jeremiah 1.12 that God watches over his word to cause it to come to pass. Do you know what that means? That means when you do the word of God, he's there backing you. He's there making it happen for you. Those are great opportunities for you and I to do the word of God day in. Sometimes you might want to do something your way because your flesh rises up, but you end up doing it God's way. And it's a great opportunity for the blessings of the Lord to fall upon. I wonder how many opportunities we have during the day that God gives us that we miss. And we find ourselves not being blessed at the end of the day, but literally being frustrated because we've just missed out on the things of God. Well, God wants to share some principles with you on why people miss opportunities. Is that okay? You can take it put it in your business. You can take it put it in your marriage. You take these same principles and put them into raising your children, kids. They're all biblically uh, described in the scripture. In the Old Testament as well, New Testament, we're going to go there today. Take a look at the word of the Lord together. So why people miss opportunities. Four, uh, three things this time. Next week when we get together, and next time when we're together, it'll be four things. But three times this one, and let's take a look at it. Why people miss opportunities. Number one, half-hearted response. 
because we have a half-hearted response to that which we should be passionate for. I mean, you stop and think about it. We need God's full blessings. I don't know about you, but if you don't want God's full blessings, could you ask God to give me your share? Because I want not only full blessings for me, I'll even take yours. Because I need them. And yet, a lot of times, people don't give a flip about them at all. Remember Jacob and Esau? Esau was blessed with having the birthright, and he just didn't care. He was half-hearted about the birthright. And you remember what happened in the scripture? Because he was half-hearted. I mean, God literally says, how would you like to have God say this about you? And have it written down in the Bible, and for thousands of years, people say this, that God hated Esau. You know why? Because he was half-hearted towards the blessings that God gave him. And oftentimes, God wants to do something and we're half-hearted. Oftentimes, God wants to direct us and we're half-hearted in receiving the direction. Oftentimes, God wants to open doors and we're half-hearted about whether you open doors or don't open doors. Well, whatever, you know? God wants to close doors. Close doesn't feel as good as open, but my good, they're as important as an open door is to have a closed door. And sometimes we all get together and we have a closed door. We feel really bad. Oh, I hate this, man. Nothing's happening. But that's the best thing in the world that can happen. So God could open a door somewhere else. But you got to go through that closed door feeling to get to the open door. What if he opened the wrong door for you and you went through it? You'd be in the wrong place not getting blessed. Opportunities. But I find that people that are wholehearted have a passion for what they want and believe that's the people that get results. There's this wonderful story in 2 Kings. You want to go there with me in the New Test Old Testament? In 2 Kings, this great story about Elisha. He said, you know the prophet Elisha? Not Elijah, but Elisha. Elisha's dying. He's on his deathbed. This king, if you will, of Israel is going to come to him. And this king is going to speak to him. And Elisha starts prophesying to this king about a battle that he's facing with the Syrian army. A lot of you are facing battles. There's some things ahead of you that, quite frankly, you don't want to know about today unless you knew the answer for today. And all of us are going to be confronted with situations that are going to come upon us, and we really need God to show us how to do this. Now, remember, we're talking about people who miss opportunities are half-hearted in, in the opportunity that was extended to them. So if God is showing you something and you're half-hearted about it, you're never going to receive the fullness that you need to have because you've lost the very passion about your needs. You've got to, in this particular case that we're going to read in 2 Kings, you've got to give it all to God and see it as a passionate expression. It's got to be so important to you that you really, hear me, really want it. Because I find that with God, a lot of times God offers, offers us opportunities about stuff, but we don't really want it when in fact I can't figure that out. If God wants me to have it, I should really want it. Not, not based on what I think, it should be based on what he thinks. And if he really wants to give it to me, then I should really want it with passion, not half-hearted. So we find this king is going to be prophesied to about the Syrian army that's coming against him. Let me read it to you if I may. 2 Kings 13 chapter starting in verse number 14. Elisha, remember the prophet. 13th chapter verse 14, 2 Kings. Elisha had become sick with illness in which he would die and Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Now, I, I, I got to tell you, I wish I had time to interpret what he just really said with that expression to Elijah. I don't. wish I could just stop with you right now and tell you, here's what he's really saying. In that expression. But I'm not going to. I'm not going to go there. Because I want to keep us on track and focused. With the point about being half hearted. Verse number 15. And Elisha said to him. Just right out of the blue. This guy's sick. He's ready to die. He's on his deathbed. And here comes his prophet going to talk to him. Man I want you to know something. When word of the Lord comes to you. 
First thing you and I ought to do is never be half-hearted about it because when the word of the Lord comes to us, that is an opportunity to go somewhere and be something and do something that we've never done before in our life. And many times the word of God will come to us and we'll just say, oh, it was said by that person. It can't really be important to me at all. And when you approach opportunities with half-heartedness, you get no results whatsoever. Is anybody listening? So in verse 15, Elisha said to him, take a bow and some arrows. Now I want you just to get a picture of this. He takes a bow. He's got a bow in his hand and some arrow. He's got more than one arrow in his hand. Are we following each other? Can you see the picture? Okay, so he tells him what to do. He takes the bows and arrows. And he took to himself a bow and some arrows. Verse number 16. Then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. And so he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hand on the king's hands. So in other words, he's just covering it. In other words, what he just said by putting his hand on top of his hand is this, is that God is going to bless you. I'm representing God, and what you do and put your hand to, God is going to put his hand on your hand. In other words, can I just say this to every single one of you? Listen to me. Because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, God wants to open doors for you and give you great opportunities. How you respond is whether or not you're going to get in those opportunities and get the results that you need to have. So it's obvious that the word of the Lord is coming to him. He puts his hand on top of his hand because he wants to bless him. And then he comes along and makes this statement. Listen to this, verse number 17. And he said, open the east window. Then he opened it. Remember, what's in his hand? A bow and what? Arrows. Plural arrows. And he says, in verse number 16, and he, and he, and he says, sorry, verse number 7. He says, open the east window. And he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he says to him, and here's a really important part. I want you to get this. For you must... He says, and he, and the arrow of the Lord, let me go back to my verses. The arrow of the Lord, deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. Listen to what he says. The arrow of the Lord's deliverance. He shot. God said these words in an expression to this man that's the king of Israel. You shot and there goes, God has shot his arrow. Now watch this. Now the other arrows, how many arrows do you shoot at one time? One. So his hands got more arrows in them. And then he probably points down to those arrows in his hands and he says these words. He says, uh, he says, for you must, he says, he says, and he said, he said, shoot, I'm, I'm losing my place here. So hold on with me. Hold on with me. The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. So in other words, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance has been shot. God has done it. But the arrows that are lo of the Lord's deliverance for Syria is in your hands. So in other words, he's got this opportunity to take the arrows that are in his hands and do something with it. Then he comes along in verse number 18, he says, then he says, take the arrows. So he took them and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck three times and stopped. Isn't it interesting that he went bang, 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 and he stopped. And the interesting part to me is why did he not just destroy those arrows? He said they were the arrows of Syria. He said they were to be totally destroyed in the verse that we read before that. Why did he only take what he had and half-heartedly hit the ground? And why does God point this out? And why is it in the scripture for you and I to see? And he says, strike the ground. So he struck three times and he stopped. Verse number 19. And the man of God was angry and said unto him, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria until they had been destroyed. But now you will strike Syria only three times. 
And if you keep on reading, you'll find that Syria was a plague to them from that point on. And if he had struck it with a wholeheartedness and he had taken advantage of just what God told him to do and he had fulfilled that obligation that God said, I want you to strike Israel. And if he had done it with a whole heart, he'd have won the battle without any problems. But he didn't win the battle because he was half-hearted in what he did. So here's a perfect example of somebody missing opportunity. He had an opportunity like you and I that God backs us. He had an opportunity like you and I that God comes forth for us. He had an opportunity for like you and I that God would deliver us. He has an opportunity like you and I have on a constant basis. But God's trying to point his, his half-heartedness stopped him from winning the battle like he should have won the battle. And oftentimes we never win, never go, never be, never say, never do what God would have us to say and be and do because we're half-hearted in what God would have us to do. Is anybody listening? It's so important for us to see this tonight. We can be half-hearted. We can think we're okay with God. Did that king not think he was okay with God? Did God not think he was, I mean, did that king think he was, he said, yeah, I'll do this. He does it in a half-hearted way. You and I have got to be passionate about what God says. If we're not passionate about what God says, we're never gonna get the results that God wants us to have. And half-heartedness keeps us from the opportunities that God has for us. Is anybody listening tonight? And it's so constant for us to see in the scripture why people miss opportunities, why people miss opportunities, number one, half-hearted response to the things of the Lord. Can I just ask you something? Stop right there. Have you ever had a half-hearted response to the things of the Lord? Is anybody in here willing to admit it besides me? Of course, but I don't want to keep on having a half-hearted response. I don't want to stay there. Half-hearted responses never get you where you need to be nor where you want to be with God. Half-hearted responses keep you from winning the battles of life, just like it kept this king from winning because he took a half-hearted thing and hit it three times when he should have been so excited and passionate about it that he beat those arrows upon the ground until that was a prophetic expression on his part that Syria would have been destroyed. Instead, Syria is a plague to him for the days to come. Doesn't have to be that way. You and I need to realize that if we're ever people of half-hearted expression towards the word of God, we need to shake ourselves and stop ourselves and get ourselves back in line, start hanging around people that will help us to stay fired up for God, help us to stay passionate for God. Someone says, what do I need to go to church for? I talked to a guy the other day. He says, I've been in this church for 10 years, but I still call it my church. Oh my goodness, how can you call it your church and you haven't been here for 10 years? You haven't done anything. He said, what do I need to go to church for? I said, I'll tell you why, because you're miserable, down, lonely, out. You've never been encouraged and you haven't changed for 10 years and you know it. And he says, whoa, that's true. <laughs> See, what we need is to hang around people of like faith, mutual faith, who Romans tells us, that are gonna take us someplace so we can stay passionate all the time for the things of the Lord. Somebody ought to say amen. Second thing, why people miss opportunities. I love this one. Improper discernment of time. When is the time? We treat time as if it's not important, yet time is probably the greatest commodity on the planet. It's probably the most valuable commodity outside of you yourself is the time that you have to accomplish something and do something. And oftentimes what we'll do is we will treat time, I'll do it tomorrow. Procrastination will kill your future. Let me say that again. And is anybody in this place a procrastinator besides me? Come on, so the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to us today. Number one, not to be half-hearted, but to be passionate. But we're all procrastinators. We all say, man, I'll do it tomorrow. You know, when you have that kind of an attitude and God wants you to do something, and we say, I'll do it tomorrow, oftentimes you just miss God because God had a timing. 
and there's a timing of the Lord and you don't know when it is and you don't know what it is and when it comes to opportunity, I want you to know something. God doesn't just sit around and wait for you to do it. He opens a door for you to go through and if you're saying to yourself, ah, that's not important to me, I judge it as something I'll do later on down the road. Today is a day of your salvation. Today is a day that you get going. Today is a day you don't half-heartedly respond any longer. Today, the time is now with God. It says now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence. God is a God of now. Not just the God of down the road someday. I'll get right with God. You never know. When the time comes, I'll have plenty of time. I want you to know something. If today is your day, this is your day. And you cannot procrastinate. And you cannot treat time as if you have all the time in the world to do what you need to do. Go with me to Matthew 25. In Matthew 25. In fact, um, in fact before we go to Matthew 25, let's do this. In Jeremiah, the 8th chapter. Here the prophet, you're already in the Old Testament. Let's just stay with the Old Testament for a moment. In Jeremiah, the eighth chapter, and it's kind of neat. Here the prophet Jeremiah is just, he's really blasting these people because they're not responding to God. They've got the wrong theology. They've got a wrong understanding of God. They let people that are corrupt teach them the word of God. They end up corrupt themselves. They didn't treat the time with God as important. Let me say it again for all of you. They didn't treat the time with God as important. When you go to work, you treat your job as important. When you spend time with your kids, you treat your kids as if they're important. When you go to the soccer game, you jump up and down and shout for your children. It's important. But when it comes time with God, it's not that important to a lot of people. And just like these people, the prophet Jeremiah is just ringing their bell, telling them, you had an opportunity with God and you missed it. And he finally comes up with this one little verse. It's a powerful verse in the eighth chapter, in verse number 20 of the eighth chapter. It says this, the harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. In other words, you had opportunity and you missed it. I'm just grateful to those people that took that opportunity in the beginning of his service. Every one of you that responded and said, you know, I'm getting out of thy seat. I'm going to do something. You know what you did? Your people that are saying something, you're saying time is important. You didn't say, I'll just wait until the end. I'll wait until tomorrow. I'll wait until next week or someday I'll do it. You said right now, bang, I'm coming. And that's the attitude you have to have with God all the time. This is not only full of passion and wholehearted, but man, time is very important. I don't know if I've got 100 years or I've got one year. I don't know if I've got one day or one month or six years, but I want you to know that today is the day that the Lord has made, and I shall rejoice and be glad. I'm not going to be glad tomorrow. I'm going to be glad today. And you treat that day of the Lord as a day of passion. Today is a day I've got to go on with God. I don't want the harvest to be beyond me. I don't want to lose my time and, and the summer is ended. I don't want to miss out on things. And you know you don't either. And you're going to have to judge it. Whatever time it's presented to you, that's the time to do it. Is anybody listening? Getting a little Pentecostal on you, aren't I? We're talking about very important things, why people miss opportunities. Number one, half-hearted response. Number two, improper discernment of time. I like this one. Number three, foolish assumptions. People miss opportunities because they assume things are the way they are when they're not. <laughs> I, can I just say something about all of us that are in here? Any of us in here, I don't care how many degrees you have or how many positions you are and how many people pat you on the back. I don't care how much money you make or how well and gifted and talented you are. The bottom line, you're not going to like this, but the bottom line is in comparison to the wisdom of God, we're all pretty stupid. All of us, including Pastor Jim, dumbest guy in town. And the bottom line for every single one of us, if we're so stupid then we need to stop assuming foolish things. 
And when we are confronted with something, that's the way it is. Instead of assuming it's going to happen the way we think it ought to happen. Can I tell you something? Every time I think things ought to happen a certain way, have you been there? It doesn't happen that way and God shows me it's going to happen the way he wants it to happen. It's like he can, I can think of a thousand ways for something to happen. God will come up with a thousand and one ways on how it's going to happen. It's like, wow. Just trying to show me how much I really need him. Stop assuming you can figure out God. Let me say it again. Stop assuming you can figure out God. Stop assuming that you and I can think of ourselves as being one step ahead of God. Let me tell you something. You're not going to be, because the timing's off when you think you're one step ahead. Now go with me to Matthew 25. Matthew 25 in the first verse. Powerful verse. New Testament, Matthew 25, verse number one. Jesus himself is speaking and teaching this lesson. And I want you to hear it because we're talking about why people miss opportunities. And if you're starting to daydream right now, it's because of half-heartedness. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to show you how easy it is to become half-hearted. If your minds are starting to wander right now, it's because you haven't discerned the time as important as the word of God is coming to you. If your attention is somewhere else and you're thinking of something else, you have not discerned that this time with a relationship with God is of any importance. And you're foolishly assuming that you've got God all figured out. Is he a loving God? Yes. Is he a compassionate and merciful God? Absolutely. Can I just say it in San Bernardino terms? Just don't screw with him. Because you're going to find yourself in big problems. Don't mess with God. I tried to put that on the billboard, but everybody talked talk me out of that word. You know me, man. I just wanted to put it up there like it is. The whole staff said, no, oh, no, you can't do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I wanted to do it, man. <laughs> I don't know where you got this, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> then the kingdom of heaven is, shall be likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. <laughs> I love this. We're talking about Foolish assumptions, why people miss opportunities. Here's the opportunity for these 10 virgins. The bridegroom is Jesus coming. And they're assuming something, and their assumptions are going to keep them away from Jesus. And Jesus is explaining it right now. Verse number two, now the five of them who were wise, circle the word wise. There's a contrast between wise and wise. And my translation is stupid. God's is foolish. There's a difference between wise and foolish. Verse number five, uh, two says it like this. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took the oil in their vessels with the lamps. Someone says, what does all of this mean, Pastor? It means there's people that are going to meet God with the Spirit of God inside of them. And there's people going to try to meet God with no spirit at all inside of them. Try to meet them on their terms instead of the God terms that we ought to have opportunity to get when we can. Jesus is explaining that. But the wise, verse 4, took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. 
Then all of those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish or stupid said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Most of us would come along in wisdom and say, Wow, let's be compassionate. I'll give you some of my oil, because you need to have it. But the wise are too wise to mess with the things of God. It's interesting how they say, No way, Jose. I'm not messing with God. You can mess with me all you want. You can get me to do whatever. But when it comes to me and my relationship with God, you're not getting me there. And let me tell you something. Anybody who foolishly assumes a relationship with God is going to come down the road or come some other way or come because you're nice to somebody else or come in some other way, this is the time to have the relationship with God. And nobody better ever distract you from the oil in your lamp. Listen, listen, then it comes along. What verse was I in? I'm just asking you, what verse was I in? Eight, okay. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of the oil that's in your lamps and you're going out. Verse number nine. But the wise answered and said, no, at least there not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. And while they went out to buy the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went, those who were ready went, those who were ready went. Let me tell you something, guys. Never, ever foolishly assume you think you got it all under control. God can come back at this very moment. And you do not want to be caught without oil in your lamp. And he says these words. He says, they went out to buy the bridegroom came and those who went uh, ready in with him and to the wedding and the door was shut. Three things that we find out tonight about why people miss opportunities according to scripture. Good things. This is great things for you and I. These are the things that wake us up. These are the things that don't pat our little ears and comfort us, but cause us to be awake and alive and cause us to be stimulated. You ought to be able to go to church and find out how to do life according to the word of the Lord. These are great things. Number one, why people miss great opportunities is because God wants to take them and God wants to bless them, but they're half-hearted toward the response of God. I don't want to be that way, neither do you. So what do you do? You get fired up and you stay fired up and you hang around people who are fired up to help you keep on going with the things of the Lord. Why? Because you don't want to improperly, number two, discern the time as if time is not important. This could be the time tonight. This could be the time and the place tonight. The eastern sky could split even tonight. And I don't know when it's coming. And anybody that says they do know is a liar according to Scripture. I want you to know something. I don't know when it's coming, but I know he is coming soon. And the eastern sky is going to split. And I want to be ready. Which is number three. And we need to not foolishly assume things all the time. That we've got it all under control. And I'm okay. Let me tell you something, if you're not okay, get okay and stay okay because it might be tonight if you foolishly assume the time that is wrong. So tonight, don't be half-hearted. Be a wholehearted, passionate person for God. Don't assume the time and foolish things, but don't misunderstand the discernment of the time and how important it is. You got time today to do what you need to do. Let's do it today. Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise. Why people miss opportunities? Take it to your business. Exactly the same thing you'll find every successful businessman is a person who made the commitment to take the risks in their life and you will cost you a risk to go for God. It'll cost you everything to go for God. That's what this is all about. Anyone that's successful, there'll be a risk involved. The risk is your identity. The risk is who you are. The risk is passions. 
that you used to express towards other things, you're now expressing towards God. There's a risk involved in being a Christian. Risk of what people think, what your friends say, what your family says. There's a risk involved. Anybody who has ever been successful, there's a common denominator in their life. Whether it's successful economically or successful spiritually, there was a risk involved. Rahab the harlot, a risk involved of her entire life. Joseph, a risk involved. David, a risk involved. Elijah, Elijah, risk involved. How about the disciples? Even Peter tried to deny that he knew Jesus. There was a risk involved hanging around this Jesus. And there's still a risk involved today. And it's going to cost you something. And it's going to cost you wholeheartedness. It's going to cost you that you never, ever discern the time as you have plenty of it. Today is the day of the Lord, and today we work for God and we live for God. And we never be a person who are foolishly assuming things because we'll miss every opportunity that comes our way. And God has spoken to each and every one of us tonight. If God spoke to you, give him a great big praise the Lord. Hallelujah.